Hey guys, welcome back to Magic TV. My name's Craig. It is nine o'clock, which means it's time for another video. And today, today, I am going to be doing a three bests, uh, three best tricks video. I haven't done one of these in about six months. So I'm going to start doing more of them again. Uh, these are where I highlight three of the best applications of a certain move, a certain principle. And I talk about why they're so good. And I even give you references as to where you can actually learn this stuff. Now, Today, I'm going to be doing the three best verbal forces of all time. Now, I'm not talking about the sort of stuff that Michael Murray does, which is exceptional. That will be another video for another time. I'm not talking about um, kind of uh, propless mentalism -y type stuff. I'm talking more about, hey, I've got a whole bunch of objects on this table and I'm going to make you pick one and I'm controlling the one that you're going to pick. Now, there's lots of different ways of doing this. And a lot of people, when they uh, when, when they think about doing this sort of thing, they think about equivoque, equivoque, magician's choice, whatever you want to call it. And that is a valid method. In actual fact, equivoque is one of the three techniques that I'm going to talk about. But there's lots of other ways of doing this as well. And I want to highlight some of those ways. Because if you're a new magician, if you're new into magic, or even if you've been doing it for a while, yeah, if you're looking for something that is the perfect everyday carry, and let's be honest, we're all we're all looking for that really cool EDC. If you're looking for that perfect everyday carry, having a really good verbal force in your repertoire will allow you to do just the most incredible impromptu magic. Uh, and and a lot of the time, if you catch me out and about, and I've literally got nothing on me. I will do this on the fly. Now, when you see the performances a little bit later on, you're going to see me with a load of random stuff on a table and I'm getting uh, Jack to pick out of this random stuff. But when I'm actually in an impromptu situation, what I'll do is I'll make a prediction to begin with. And I, if I've not got a piece of paper or a business card, I'll just write it on a napkin or something. And I'll typically write phone or keys. And the reason is I'll say to somebody, Reach into your pocket, grab some stuff and put it down on the table in front of you. I'm going to show you something with something out of your pockets. And then what happens is they will go into their pockets and there's always a set of keys. You're always going to have a phone. You're always going to have keys. Um, you don't really have pocket change as much these days. But if you get people to go into their pockets, you're always going to have a set of keys, right? So I will make the prediction keys from the very beginning and I'll give that to somebody to hold before they've even taken the stuff out of their pockets. So I'm predicting what they're going to do before I even know what's on the table. And if somebody randomly doesn't have a set of keys on them, I'll say, yeah, we'll use this and we'll use this. Have you got some stuff in your pocket as well? What have you got? And I'll engineer it so that I've got a set of keys on the table with me. And then I can have this prediction accurately predict exactly what it is that they were doing. So for an everyday carry, for an EDC, this is an amazing technique that you can do anytime, anywhere. And having the ability to predict the outcome of something that apparently is a free choice is great. However, you can take these applications and you can incorporate them into longer, more complicated routines. And, uh, you know, you see a lot of people using Equivoke in, in tricks that involve playing cards, for example. You can use these techniques in so many different ways, not just as a standalone prediction like you're seeing me do here, but you can use them in so many other ways. Now, with that all being said, we're going to start off right now with probably the most popular and well-known verbal forcing procedure ever known, Equivoke. So I want to start off talking about equivoque, equivocate. Look, there's a million different ways of saying it, and I don't know who's right and who's wrong at this point, to be honest. I've always typically said equivocate, but I know there's going to be people in the comments that are going to say it's equivoque. Um, it's magician's choice. It's the whole idea of apparently giving somebody a free choice, whilst in reality they aren't having a free choice. You are engineering the results of the uh, of the decisions that they're making. Now, I'm going to show you a performance of me doing this to Jack. And then when you've seen the performance, we'll talk about why this is such a valid oh. technique. Uh, I've got five random objects and I'm here with Jack. How are you doing, Jack? I'm good. Good. Uh, I've actually got seven objects because uh, I've got a business card and I've got a coffee. The coffee has got nothing to do with this trick, but Kay has just made coffee for everyone in the office. So we all have coffee here while we're filming. So we've got uh, the, the, the fix there. Uh, exactly. Hmm. Oh, Kay makes a good coffee so much better than yours. But anyway. Um, Harsh, but true. 
but true. Um, so uh, the other object that has nothing to do with this is this. This is a prediction. It's a prediction of something that's going to happen in the not too distant future. I'm trying to actually predict what you're going to do. Now I have um, I have five objects here. I have some AirPods. Right. I have a Sharpie marker. Mm. I have a pack of cards. I have a Rubik's cube with a broken bottom, and nobody wants a broken bottom. And finally, I have a pair of scissors. Five items to scissors. Yeah, right. Now, when I snap my fingers, what I would like you to do is uh, with this hand here, with your left hand, pick up any one of the five objects. If you could do that right now. Okay, perfect. And then uh, when I snap my fingers with your right hand, you're going to pick up one of the objects. Excellent. You happy with those two? Don't wear any weapons. So. Put them to one side. Very good. Now, what you're going to do now is you're left with three objects. When I snap my fingers this time, you're going to push, very important you do this, you're going to push two towards me at the same time. Two hands, push two towards me. It's up to you which two. Okay. You're going to push two towards me. Can you do that right now? You sure? Yep. You, you can change your mind if you want to. I'll stick with that. Okay. So you've been left with the Sharpie marker. Yeah. And that was your choice. It was. You made all the decisions. We slowly eliminated down to the Sharpie marker. And this prediction has been here from the very, very beginning. Oh, God, not Before again. we even began, this prediction has been down here. You're not going to believe it, but I actually wrote on here, you will take the, the Sharpie. I don't get these ones. How do you know that? I'm getting inside your head, Jack. I live rent-free inside your fucking brain. In my brain, was I plotting ways to kill him in the future? So, <laughs> <laughs> so that is an example of uh, equivocate. Um, I've been using Magician's Toys Equivocate for years. It was one of the first techniques I ever learned when I first got into magic. And when I realized that you had the ability to apparently give people a free choice whilst in reality not giving them a free choice, I was blown away. I was like, oh my gosh, this is incredible. This is such a smart idea. And I spent a long time learning how to do it. And if you are a member of my Netflix platform, you'll know that I've taught on there how to do full deck equivokes, where literally you're having someone pick a card and you're equivoking down to one playing card, even though they feel like they're making all of the choices in their head. You can take equivoke and you can combine it. So if you saw my project visible and I talked about the invisible deck on there and applications in the invisible deck, I put a... Um, a routine on there where somebody uh we had a it, the whole idea was it was a uh, a story talking about uh, a night that I went gambling and I won money and I have them make lots of decisions and I get them to decide the card uh that was used for me to win the game uh the place that we were actually uh, uh, having the game, the, the, the game we were playing, all these decisions were made and there were lots of different techniques incorporated in order to get to the final revelation. But I also said, how much money did I put down to begin with? And that part was equivocate. I, ha I said, look, let's use our imagination. We've got a 10, 20, 50, we've got 100, uh, 100 pounds. How much do you think I went? And I, I forced using equivocate the amount that would be on the revelation at the end. And then there were lots of other techniques as well. And that's what I mean about how you can actually incorporate Magician's Choice into longer routines. And, you know, there's so many different ways of using equivocate. And I think that a lot of magicians and mentalists shy away from it because it's almost considered public domain these days. It's almost considered something that lay people learn. But when it's done properly and it's done correctly, it can be so fooling. And, and what I would encourage you to do is look up the work of Max Maven, first of all, because, you know, the late, great Max Maven, I think nobody would argue with the statement that he was probably the greatest of all time when it came to understanding equivocate and, um, and how to actually use it correctly. Um, somebody else that you might want to look at is J uh, John Carey. He's got uh, books and courses all about the use of equivocate. In fact, John's on my Netflix platform and he actually teaches a couple of tricks that uses equivocate and, and his understanding of it is, is genius, to be perfectly honest. Um, so yeah, it's a really valid technique and it works really on the concept of 
They don't know what you're going to do. They don't know how this procedure is going to work. So because they don't know how this procedure is going to work, you're literally... Uh, it's a little bit like jazzing with a memorized deck. You know, I did a video on this channel a little while ago about jazzing with, an, uh, with a memorized deck. And they don't really know what's going to happen. So you can vary it depending on the decisions they make and depending on where you want this whole process to go. Well, it's exactly the same with Magician's Choice. You're, but you don't want it to look like you're having to think. So the key thing with Equivoke or Quivoke is to make it look like uh, there's no thought process from your point of view and the procedure that you're going through was always going to be the procedure and when it's done right it can be incredibly fooling now <clears throat> the next technique we're going to be looking at i don't think i've ever met another magician who uses this technique and it is incredible so we're going to look at this one next this is quinta by Phil Smith. So the next technique is called Quinter and it's by Phil Smith and it was published in uh, his big book of mentalism, The Codex, which by the way, if you haven't got, uh, you really should get because it is incredible. Now I want to give a big shout out to a magician called Shark Traeger here because I've had The Codex for years and, and you know, read it and it's such a big book, you can miss things. And I completely missed Quinter and it was when I was chatting to Shark about mentalism techniques that he said to me, hey, Quinter. And I was like, what? And, and, and I went back and I checked the, checked the book and it's there and, uh, you know, Shark went through it with me, but then I, I went and, and uh, looked at what Phil said about it as well. This is, has become rapidly my favorite verbal forcing method. This has become probably my favorite everyday carry routine. I will literally do this at the drop of a hat. I will, I love this so much. And I'm coming up with so many different ways of using this principle, it's incredible. In essence, what you have here is the ability to very, very fairly force one of five objects. So if you've got five objects on the table without any sort of equivocate, you're going to be able to force one of those objects. Now, let's have a look at a performance of it. This is me doing it to Jack. So we're going to have a look at the performance. And then after the performance, we'll um, talk about why this is so good. But I'm going to show you something crazy. And <coughs> I have here a prediction. Right. On the other side, I've written what I think that you're going to do. And I'm going to put that there in front of you so that from the very beginning, that prediction was put on the table. Now... You are going to have a free choice in a second. I have five objects. I have a pack of playing cards. I have some scissors. I have a Sharpie. I have some AirPods. And I have a Morgan Silver Dollar. Five different objects. Now, in a second, I'm going to have you name a number, say, from five to 50. Right. Now, when you name that number, uh, we're going to count to that number, uh, going back and forth, one object at a time. Uh, and we'll randomly stop on an object. So it's completely up to you. The choice is yours because whatever number you pick is going to give a completely different outcome. So when I snap my fingers, you're going to name that number. 32. Now, would you like to change your mind? I don't want you saying I made you pick 32. Are you happy with 32? Sorry, 32. Okay, watch. Got like a dollar on scissors. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty one, twenty two, twenty three, twenty four, twenty five, twenty six, twenty seven, twenty eight, twenty nine, thirty, thirty one, thirty two. Airpods. Airpods. Now, if you'd have gone 31, it would have been the Sharpie. <coughs> 30 would have been the scissors. 29 would have been the pack of cards, and so on and so forth. I could not have known that you would pick the Airpods. That was a choice that you made. I did. And remember I said I was going to make a prediction of what you were going to do before you did it. It's and not. that prediction has been here the whole time. I actually wrote on this prediction, you will pick <gasps> the AirPods. What Just the like that. Can I one more? No. So that's a demonstration of, of Quinta. It's absolutely amazing. Think about how strong that is. You put five objects down on the table, they name a number, you count to that number, and, and that's the force item. And it works every single time. I was on the, uh, a Zoom call with Lloyd Barnes recently, and I was speaking to Lloyd Barnes about forcing methods, and I mentioned this, and he said, I've never seen it. And I was on Zoom, so I showed it to him and completely fooled him. He had no idea how it worked. And it's difficult to fool Lloyd Barnes, I'm telling you right now. 
This is brilliant. And I love, there's so many things I love about this, but one of the things I love the most is how direct this this is. There's no procedure. It's not like, right, take this one away. Now take this one away. And as I said before, there's nothing wrong with that. But this is very direct. I'm going to have you name a number. We're going to count one at a time to that number and we'll end up on an object and that's the object that we use and it's really even more fooling when you go well hang on this is the number you made this is what you ended up on one less would have been here one less would have been here you made all the decisions and it seems completely impossible and yet immediately that they name the number you can always end up on the object that you want to force. And there's so many different ways that you can do with this. Now, since I've uh, I've learned this technique, I've been going down a rabbit warren of uh, ideas and concepts and, uh, you know, really, really um, um, crazy routines. I've got coincidence style routines. I've got, uh, I've, I've just, I tell you what, I did impromptu the other day. Uh, a, uh, a a bank night style thing where I had a post-it note. I was I was uh, actually at a friend's office and there was a post-it note on the table and they said, hey, do a trick. So I took the post-it note and I just wrote openly so they could see them. I wrote 100, 100, 100, 100. On four of the post-it notes, I wrote 100 pounds. And on the other one, I wrote nothing. And I had them mix them up and I had them put them down on the table and, and I said, the idea is there's four 100 pound post-it notes. There's one that says nothing. My job is to try to get you to end up on the one that says nothing. And if I can do that, then, um, you know, you've got to give me a big round of applause for being so clever. But if you end up in any one of the others, you're going to win 100 pounds. Think about it. They bulled them up. They put them down on the table. They mixed them up. They did everything. I had somebody randomly name a number. So they ended up on one in particular. I opened up the others. It's 100. It's 100. It's 100. It's 100. I opened up theirs. It was nothing. Got an incredible reaction. If you're kind of into that influence style presentation where you're kind of uh, making people think that you can influence them. That was an incredible impromptu version of Bank Night. I just literally did off the top of my head because of knowing this principle. If you don't know Quinta, you absolutely should learn it. Go and beg, borrow, or steal a copy of the Codex, or even better, go and speak to Phil Smith, because I'm sure that he could sell you one. Um, because this is such a useful technique. This whole video is about verbal forces but this is my favourite verbal force out of all three of them that I'm presenting on this video. Phil Smith, I've said it before, I'm going to say it again. The guy's a genius. Okay, so the final one we're going to talk about today, the final technique that we can use to verbally force somebody onto an object is the patio force. Now, the reason I'm actually using the patio force here, uh, or the reason that I'm actually highlighting the patio force, is because I have mentioned this a couple of times on videos and and there's a lot of people that have said to me what's the patio force i don't know what the patio force is i've never heard of it before and you know i think it was you know what I, I, it was probably before that but the first time i remember watching it being used and thinking that's really clever was on get nyman by andy nyman and alec azam from years and years and years ago he had a routine on there using the patio force and i remember thinking that is incredibly clever um, and then I started using it and uh, I use it for a few different things and it's it's a great force it really is it's got a lot of advantages like with the equivoke uh, or equivoque you really have to kind of think on your feet right you really have to think on your feet in order uh, to get the correct outcome with Quinta there's some basic maths, nothing difficult at all by any stretch of the imagination. But I've shown this to Nemid Phoenix, who's not great at maths. And he was like, no, I'm out. I'm out. I can't do maths. And I know there's people that struggle with the invisible deck, which is literally taking the name, the number of the card that they've named away from 13, you know. Uh, so I know that some people struggle with maths, which is fine. There's no problem with that. If you struggle with maths, you might find Quinter a little bit out of your uh, out of your skill set. I don't know. You have to go and try and find it yourself. I'm really good at maths. I enjoy mental arithmetic. Um, but with this, with the patio force, there is no mathematical uh, juggling around at all. There's no thinking on your feet and deciding what you need to do based on their actions. This just works itself. And the other thing is, it's a really nice fun presentation, if, especially if we present it as a game where you're gonna take, um, uh, you know, you're gonna take turns eliminating objects until there's only one left. 
Uh, it's really, uh, really clever and uh, presentationally sound as well. So again, I'm going to show you a performance of this to Jack, who at this point was getting sick to death of me forcing objects on him. I'm going to show you a performance to Jack. And then after the performance, we're going to talk about how it all, um, well, not how it works. I can't do that, but I will tell you why it's so good. Jack, like I said, you went and with Michael, uh, you bought a load of random crap and put it on my table. I don't even know how, much, how many things are here. This is not part of the random crap. Is this is a prediction. Ooh. It's a prediction of something that's going to happen in a second. I'm going to have you make a bunch of decisions. We're going to play a little game, and between us, we're going to eliminate all these objects down to one. Okay. I'm hopeful that I'm predicting the outcome of that little game. Oh, that prediction know. goes here, right here from the very beginning. So we've got a bunch of stuff. We've got, uh, and I don't know how much stuff you bought. You bought nine items, and that's fine. It, you know, it could have been more. Could have been less, it doesn't matter. We've got a pack of cards, we've got a glue stick, we've got a Chinese coin, a Rubik's Cube with a piece missing, but whatever. A, uh, a pair of scissors, a Sharpie, some AirPods, a tennis ball, and a Morgan dollar. So we've got a whole bunch of stuff here. So, um, the idea is, I'm gonna start off by, uh, and, and remember this prediction's been here from the very beginning. Yep. I'm gonna start off by picking two objects. Right. And out of those two objects, you have to select one that you want to eliminate. Okay. That'd be your choice. Then after that, you're then going to pick two objects for me, and I'm going to eliminate one. Right. Then I'm going to pick two for you, and we're going to keep going Take until times. we've got one left. Exactly. So it's going to be completely random, and we're making all of the decisions together, but it really is down to you. So we'll start off with two random objects. I'm going to start off with the Chinese coin in the pack of cards. Which one do you want to eliminate? Let's get rid of the cards. Okay, the cards have gone. So now you've got to pick two for me. Okay. The Sharpie. Yeah. And the glow stick. I don't like ink on my fingers. We'll get rid of the Sharpie. Sharpie's gone. You have tattoos. Uh, <laughs> it's different, 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 different thing. Right, let's go. I am a coin guy, so I'm going to go for the two coins. Which one do you want to get rid of? The silver dollar. You sure? Yep. You're even. Right, that's fine. Um, uh, now your choice. What two do you want me to... Uh, the scissors mm -hmm. and the glue stick. Scissors scare me. Let's get rid of the scissors. Um, the AirPods and uh, the Rubik's Cube. AirPods. AirPods are gone. There you go. The Chinese coin mm -hmm. and the Rubik's Cube. I cannot get rid of the Rubik's Cube. I love it. I'm sorry, Chinese coin. You've got to go. Um... The Rubik's Cube and the tennis ball. Tennis ball. Tennis ball's going? Yeah. Right. And we're left with a Rubik's Cube and a glue stick. Ryan was very naughty last night. I've changed my mind. The cube is going. <laughs> what did he do? <laughs> yeah, you don't want to know, but his mom wanted to kill him. Um, so we've been left with the glue stick, and that was a free choice. You made all the decisions. It was a free choice. Yeah, I mean, we, you know, it, it, it was completely random at the end of the day. Um, if you have eliminated another object or picked a different object to me, we would have ended up with a different thing, but we ended up with the glue stick. And I said I was going to predict uh, the outcome of this little game from the very beginning. And from the very beginning, I put on this business card, you will pick what the, the glue stick. Have a look at that. So there you go. That is um, that is the patio force. Just in case you're wondering, the uh, the patio force stands for pick any two, eliminate one, because that's basically what you're doing. You're picking two, they're eliminating one. They're picking two, um, and you're eliminating one. The nice thing is this will work with any amount of objects. Um, Quinta will only work with five objects. You can't have any more than five. Uh, Equivocate will work technically with any amount of objects, but the more objects you've got, the more difficult it is to get to the final uh, decision. Uh, but with the patio force, you can have any amount of objects. It makes absolutely no difference. All you need to know is how many objects you have that you're working with, and then you're good to go. Um, now, you might say it's not as strong as the other two techniques that I've talked about because with the other two techniques with 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 equivocate they're making all of the choices with quinta 
they're making the choice of the number. With this, you're eliminating half the objects and they're eliminating half the objects. And if you're thinking that, I totally get your thinking. I totally understand where you're coming from. I disagree. And the reason I disagree is even when you're eliminating an object, they're deciding which objects that you're going to eliminate from. Um, so it doesn't feel like that. And, and on, honestly, I perform this to lay people and, and they're absolutely blown away by this. This is something that works really, really well. And again, just like with all the other techniques, you can incorporate this into a longer routine. You can incorporate it into uh, you know, a much longer routine and it sits really well in there. So yeah, if you're looking for, and I, I, again, I can't stress the fact that one of my favorite things about this is presentationally, you can even just like run it as a bit of a game. Hey, we're going to play a game. Uh, you're going to eliminate objects. I'm going to eliminate objects. We're going to take it in turns uh, until we get to the end. And then we'll we'll see where we're at. Um, but that presentation makes everything seem really, really fair. And, and the more objects that you've got on the table, the more impossible this becomes. So, yeah, it's called the Patio Force. Again, it stands for Pick Any Two, Eliminate One. And uh, you can learn this uh, from, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things that's almost become public domain now in the, if you went onto YouTube, oh, Craig said go onto YouTube to learn a trick. Yeah, I did deal with it. And if you go onto YouTube and type in patio force, there's probably somebody who's teaching it on there. Just make sure that you get the right teacher. Don't get a Muppet teaching you how to do it. Make sure that you find a video where the person that's teaching it knows what they're talking about. But there you go. That's patio, the patio force. That's our third verbal, verbal force that we're going to be talking about today. So there you go, guys. That's another video in the bag. Thank you once again for joining me right here on Magic TV. Don't forget, you want to see more videos like this, you know what you got to do. You just got to like the video, subscribe to the channel, leave a comment down below. Now, I'm going to be back again tomorrow with another video, so watch out for that. But uh, thanks very much for watching. I really appreciate it. I'll see you soon. My name's Craig from Magic TV. Mm -hmm.